When someone asks you to help check a translation, where do you start? What kinds of questions should you ask? This happened to me recently, so let's talk about it. Also, it's been a while since we dug deep into some actual checking issues that arise in real-world situations. So let's talk about some of the things I've been running into in Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Here we go. So as I said, recently, the director of UNTI, which is the National Bible Translation Organization here in Mexico, approached me about helping with another translation that I hadn't been working on before. So this particular translation needed a consultant to check several books that they already have drafted. I accepted. I went to work the first session. So let's talk about the first session. What kind of questions do I typically ask, and this is not a template that I'm saying that everybody should follow, but I think it's a good model to start with. So, first thing that I want to know, how vital is the language? What's the language vitality? Is it alive? Are people using it? Because I want to know that my time as a consultant is being used to help a language project that is going somewhere and is going to be used. I've learned this the hard way over the years because, as you've probably heard in my past podcast episodes, in Equatorial Guinea, there were a handful of languages that just were dying out and people were blindly going forward trying to produce a translation, even though nobody wanted it, nobody would use it. And even though it's nice for the translator himself or herself to want to have the Word of God in their language— that's actually not really enough to justify an entire translation project. You have to know that people are actually still speaking their language so that there will be somebody else besides the translator who will be able to use it someday. That's just the case in many places in the world that the trade language or the national language is swallowing up these minority languages. So that was my first question. You know, what is what is the language like? And one of the ways to get to the bottom of that is by asking how the children are using the language. Do children actually speak this language with their parents or are they speaking mainly Spanish? Do children speak this language with their friends? And how do they use it in the churches? So in this case, this is a language group where there is an established presence of Christianity, and there are different denominations present in the villages. So my question is, are the churches actually using the language in the services? Do they sing in the language? Do they have interpretation from Spanish into that language or vice versa? Or do they only preach in that language? This also gives me the opportunity to get to know the people group on a more personal level. So what's the cultural environment like? Because the language environment dictates a lot of what the cultural environment will be like. So the other question is, how are they using the language in schools? Are they teaching kids to read that language or is there a strong bias against the local language as there was in Equatorial Guinea? where everyone was required by force to only speak Spanish within the classroom. So in this case, it's called the Mixteco language. And the person I was talking to, she told me that the, in her consideration, the vitality was high. There's about 15,000 people in the village. The alphabet has been taught since the 1980s. And literacy is now taught minimally in schools. 50% of Christians read the New Testament that they have in Misteco, and there are primers for literacy and occasional workshops. There are a few New Testament books in audio, and as far as the churches go, all their songs are in Spanish, and there's a mix of languages for preaching. So some people, just depending on who they are, will preach in Misteco and others will preach in Spanish. Most of the churches are Pentecostal, 
And then there are some Baptist churches and others, of course, Catholic. And the Baptist church is the one that sings the most in Misteco. So there's an extra point for the Baptists. <laughs> but you can see where I'm going here. If I'm talking about an Old Testament project, then I want to know what's the history of the New Testament there. Do they have one? What's its reception been like? How much do they use it? And all of that. Really important information to understand what you're getting into. And all of this contributes to having a deeper relationship with the translators as you go along because you know more about who they are and you want to listen to them about their people group and what goes on in their village and all that sort of thing. So this is a good conversation for just developing a relationship as well. The next big question is, why do you want an Old Testament if this is that kind of project? When did the desire for an Old Testament start? And she told me that back in 2001 is when a desire for it began to surface. As I understand it, there was a young man named Ephraim who had a desire to help with this sort of thing. And so he spearheaded the effort and did some translation studies with SIL and got some of the basics under his belt. And he set about translating the Pentateuch, the Psalms, and Ezekiel. And then some others in his people group helped with Kings and Samuel and Ruth. So after this, I also want to know, what are the churches doing for this project? How are the churches behind it? Are the churches behind it, the local churches? And she told me that only three churches are behind this and committed so far. Now, this brings me to another big question. What kind of language studies have been done on this language, and are there any publications available? And in this case, there were. There was a grammar and dictionary in Spanish that had been done by SIL back in the day. There was also a phonology write-up, but so far there has not been any discourse analysis done on the language. So we talked at length about that, and that was one of the things that I told her I would like to, you know, as we go along with this project, be gathering discourse information on the language so that we both have a better understanding of how that works in this language. So speech reporting and that sort of thing. So we talked about how we could gather some natural texts and do a discourse analysis together. Now, the other big question I always have is, what is poetry considered to be in your language? Do you have a tradition of poetry? Because this is an Old Testament project, you're going to hit a huge amount of poetry, and so you need to know what is considered poetic in their language. Have they thought about that? Do they have poets in their community? How is poetry different from narrative in their minds? So you cannot, you can never take it for granted that a people group has a form of poetry. Unfortunately, that, that kind of blows a lot of people's minds, I think. We, we as North Americans and Westerners often just assume that every language in the world has poetry, but it's not true. Now, this may be for different reasons. I think one of the main reasons in Mexico is that They are in the aftermath of a long, long season of colonialization. 500 years of colonialism has definitely wiped out a lot of traditions, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of historical data on these languages, how they used to be in their golden years before the Spaniards came and messed everything up. It's often very sad for me to talk to some of these groups and hear how much has been lost of their culture, traditions, and language. There are definitely words, many beautiful words that they might have had 500 years ago for all sorts of things that have now been lost because of Spanish influence and globalization. And this particular language, Mixteco, is no exception. So they're a victim of this kind of loss. So they don't even have traditional songs in their language that remain. And as far as she knows, there's no poetic tradition that still stands. 
Now, she did mention one gentleman in the community that does like to write poetry in his language, but it's basically him thinking in Spanish and taking cues from Spanish form and function in poetry and just putting that in his language. But it's not using their own particular unique cultural ways of doing poetry. Now, what I've noticed is the difference between a place like Equatorial Guinea and Mexico, where Equatorial Guinea is only seeing the effects of a hundred years of colonialism as opposed to 500 years here in Mexico. And that makes a difference. I noticed that there were so many more things that the Fong people in Equatorial Guinea had that were features of their language and culture and poetry and songs and all that sort of thing that were very strong and preserved. And that was great. But now over here in Mexico, I'm seeing how much they've lost. Now, the other big question that I'll ask is, what about the history of Christianity in general in your people group? And in this particular case, it's a really interesting story. In 1973, the gospel arrived via tracts that were dropped from a plane. (laughs) So there was a guy, it was a Mexican guy who was flying around in a Cessna dropping tracks in these little mountain villages in different places. And that was how they first encountered the gospel. And then in 1982, a New Testament translation was begun. Now, another question is, what other kinds of discussions have you had with other consultants who have helped with this project? So many times, a project will have fits and starts. And one consultant will help for a while, and then they'll have to leave for one reason or another. And then another will have to pick it up where they left off, etc. And so what I want to know is, what have other consultants said already about your translation? What kinds of discussions have you had about certain key terms? Big things like the name of God, or how to translate covenant, or the word righteousness, for example. So I want to sit and listen and learn from what has already happened. Because I know how frustrating it can be when somebody has to repeat over and over the same thing. So I want to just preempt some of that and anticipate, okay, what are some of the things that we don't need to, to hash out again? So she mentioned a few things, uh, not a lot. And hopefully, hopefully, if you're doing this with a project that's already been worked on in Paratext, there will be a paper trail in Paratext that you can look at. So the previous consultant's notes should be embedded in the project that you can go back and see that whole history and those conversations that they had on those written notes. Now, ideally the previous consultant would also leave a paper trail of these kinds of big questions at the beginning of a project so that they can just hand those over to the next consultant in line. And that consultant doesn't have to have all of this conversation all over again to start. But so far in my experience, I've seen that many consultants don't do this. So I have to start from square one with all of this. So another big question. What is your translation philosophy and style that you're aiming for in this translation? What model is the kind of translation you're aiming for? So in English, you might answer that question, well, I'm trying to do something more like the NASB, or I'm trying to do something more in the the vein of the NLT. So in this case, they are shooting for something that's more of a middle ground, like the NIV is what she told me. So next I asked, what have your translation struggles been? What are some of the real big challenges that you've faced over the course of this project so far? So not surprisingly, her answers to that were, number one, poetry, and number two, to make it natural. And this is a perennial struggle for all translators. So poetry always is super, super difficult. And the issue of making it natural, sometimes maybe people don't think of, but it is a struggle. One of the most common temptations is to want to follow the source text. So in this case, they're translating from Spanish versions, to follow them too closely 
and let the naturalness in your own language suffer. And as I've mentioned before, one of the reasons I'm a passionate advocate of oral Bible translation and oral drafting is because that helps to get people farther away from that temptation. Now, after that question about their struggles, I like to ask some cultural and worldview questions. So, for example, what is the heart in your culture and language? What does the heart do? Now, of course, that's assuming that they do have a word for heart, and many languages do. And in this case, they do. It's very, very similar to how the Hebrew worldview considers the heart. It's the center of the human being, where a person lives. Now, the other thing I like to know is what is marriage like in their culture? This is a big one. This reveals a lot and also helps you understand what kinds of clashes there will be in communicating Old Testament stories where marriage and concubines and all those sorts of things are involved. Historically, in this culture, there was wife stealing. But if a guy did things correctly, he would go and talk to his parents. So this is very much like Samson, I noticed, what Samson did. He would go tell his parents, I want this particular girl And then they would go ask about the girl. They would have a conversation with that girl and her parents and get her for him or not. Traditionally, the age of a girl getting married would be about 12 to 13 years old. Now, things have changed because of globalization, and it's more normal for an 18 to 19-year-old guy to marry a 15-year-old girl. So the girls are a little older now. She also told me that it's very important that the girl be younger in a marriage. And in the Catholic tradition now, an elder of the Catholic Church usually should go with the father to ask about the girl. Now, along these lines, I like to ask, okay, is marriage mainly a utilitarian sort of thing? Or do you guys have a concept or value for romance. And she said that it can be utilitarian, just like it can be in our culture, but the girl's opinion does matter. So the girl doesn't have to do it against her will. They do consider her opinion as opposed to other cultures. Traditionally, she explained, there was no talking of falling in love or that sort of thing. But now because of globalization, that has become the fashion. Now, along with marriage, of course, comes the topic of divorce, which is a big issue in the Bible. And so, I like to hear what they think about that and what their culture considers a reason for divorce or if they do divorces. And she said, before in the old days, it was practically unknown. There was only abandonment, but now they have more of the divorce kind of mentality creeping in. Now, another question that I've learned the hard way to ask is the following. Is the goal of your translation to preserve the misteco of the older generation or the younger? Now, you have to understand that this is a sociolinguistic issue that's very prominent nowadays. Because of globalization, we're having very strong shifts in the languages from one generation to to the next because of Spanish and other things. So you cannot take for granted that a 60-year-old in the village will speak the same way as a younger person. Now, obviously, we have these kinds of shifts in our own culture, right? My parents speak a brand of English that's slightly different from mine. And depending on where you live and your cultural background in North America, that gap can be bigger or smaller. But I've noticed that this can be a much bigger issue with these minority languages. So, for example, I was working with the Chitino group here in Mexico, and the normal thing to do to understand their discourse is to get the best storytellers to tell stories and record natural texts that you can analyze. 
Well, the problem is that the best speakers of the language are usually the people from the older generation. They tend to be more well-spoken. They tend to have more vocabulary. And so you end up gathering language data from their generation, and then you process it and you realize that they, they have certain features. So after I realized that they had these certain features in their language, I went back to them. I said, why aren't you doing this with the translation? And they said, well, we're not trying to preserve the older generation's form of speaking. We're going to adapt our translation. We've decided to adapt it to the younger generation's way of speaking the language, which has some markedly different features. So I realized if I had just asked that in the beginning, I would have saved myself a lot of wasted work. Now, in the case with this Misteco translation, she told me that they want to have a kind of an even mix of the older generation's Misteco and the younger generation's. And then finally, I like to ask some general grammar and language questions to get a feel for some of the bigger features of that language. So, for example, does it have gender? And in this case, they don't have gender. Do they have different pronouns for respect? So, if you're speaking to a child, do you use a different pronoun than you would for your elder, for example? And they do. They do this, and this, this is very common in many languages in Mexico. And then finally, how do they report speech normally? You could always report speech before the speech happens. So, and God said, let there be light. So, God said is the speech reporting element Do you have that before the speech comes? Can you have speech reporting in the middle of speech? So, for example, I'm hungry, said Mary, and I want to go to the store. So, there it's right in the middle, and we have this in our English Bibles. We have all three. We have at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. But the Fong language in Equatorial Guinea, you cannot put it in the middle and you cannot put it at the end. It can only be at the beginning. And it seems to be that with this particular language, their speech reporting often will come at the beginning and at the end, even though it sounds redundant to us. So an example of this, what they did in Genesis 1.14, says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, he said. And then finally, another example of something that I want to know. Does your language do rhetorical questions? How do you handle rhetorical questions? And in this particular language, they don't. So, all the rhetorical questions that Hebrew loves to use, they had to convert into statements or something else. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful to give you a broad idea of how you can start when you're beginning to check a new project. Now, as I promised at the beginning, I wanted to get into a few real-world situations that I've encountered recently with both Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel. So, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 10, we have this verse. The Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. So, in the back translation of one of the translations I'm checking, I ran into this issue of the fear of God. Now, in the back translation, they had that they may learn to obey me for the rest of their lives. So, here's what, let's, let's look at what the handbook for translators by, published by UBS says on this phrase. The translation of the phrase, to fear God, may be difficult. See also 529, 62, 13, and 24. The basic idea is that of reverence or awe as befits God's transcendence and holiness. A word that means simply be afraid of should not be used. NJPSV and NIV have revere, FRCL, respect, obey, is in the 
TEV and CEV is not satisfactory here, it says. Obey is not satisfactory here. Translators should, if possible, use a term that refers to great respect or awe in cultures that are ruled by chiefs or kings. Such a term should be readily available. A possible solution in English is to use two words, for example, respect and obey. If no suitable term is found, we may follow the solution of BRCL. It uses the normal verb to fear and marks it with an asterisk with the following explanation in the glossary. Fear God, show respect or reverence for God in acknowledgement of his greatness and holiness. It does not mean simply to be afraid of God, but to show him respect, love, obedience, and worship. End quote. So, of course, since we already mentioned that they have terms or pronouns for respect in this culture, I would assume that they have other ways of speaking of respecting or reverencing somebody. So, we had a conversation about this, and she said that she would check with some other people in the community and get back to me. Now, in the very next chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, we hit the Ten Commandments. And this is a huge translation challenge because there is so much writing on these commandments. There are so many expectations that people have. There are so many traditions that people have around them of understanding them. And so it can be a delicate issue. And also many things can surface that people never understood to begin with with these commandments. So right out of the gate, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me in the ESV. They have in their back translation, only I am God, do not have another God. Now let's see what the translation handbook says. This may be expressed, you shall or must not worship any other God except me, or do not worship any God but me. NJB translates, you will have no other gods other than me. It is better to use the verb worship or obey rather than have. This commandment does not deny the existence of other gods. It demands of the Israelites that they acknowledge only God as their God. Psalm 81, 9 through 10 has a good statement of this first commandment. The you is singular, as mentioned in the introduction to this chapter, but many translators will wish to use a plural pronoun here and throughout the rest of the chapter. End quote. Now, I wasn't entirely happy with this discussion, so I went actually back to Exodus 20 to see if there was in that commentary a more full discussion of this commandment, and there was. So, I translated that commentary into Spanish and put that in the note and basically said, hey, let's see if this influences what you've got. Go ahead and read this because I still think they could do a little better with their translation there. Now, if you've listened to my podcast episodes on the divine name, then you'll be familiar with the discussion on the name command. So, What we have in English, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So in Deuteronomy 5.11, we ran into this problem in this particular translation where they're basically saying in the back translation, do not use my name badly. So in a note, a very, very long note, I left the whole discussion in Spanish that mostly comes from Carmen Joy Imes on this whole concept of what it actually means to bear the name of God to nothingness or emptiness or in vain. And it ultimately means do not misrepresent God in his character. Now, in verse 17, you have the murder command. You shall not murder, lo tirzach, And this one can be a challenge because in some languages, they may not have a distinction like Hebrew does between killing and murdering. And so here it is the latter, and we want to communicate that. In the back translation, it simply said, do not kill people. And so I asked, 
is this just killing in general, or are you referring to murder? And then I put a note that talks a little more about this whole issue. Now, another thing that I've been noticing throughout this translation is that there's been a struggle to communicate purpose clauses, and I'm not sure if it's a struggle to communicate that or see it in the back translation, or if it's a struggle to do it in the actual language. But as you know, in the Bible, there are many clauses where God is saying, do this so that, and in Hebrew, if you know Hebrew, that would be lama'an, so that this will happen. You know, so for example, in Deuteronomy 5.33, you shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live. So there you go, that, or so that you may live, and so that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. So these purpose clauses are often not coming out, and I'm having to ask, put in a lot of notes to say, did you mean to say so that? Many times I'm only finding a comma, then the future tense of something. So, comma, you will have a good life and you will live many years in the land that God is giving you kind of thing. Now, let's jump over to 1 Samuel real quick. First, First Samuel chapter 1 is actually quite challenging in the Hebrew. There's a lot of textual issues going on and surprising ones that you may not expect. A simple verse, you'd think, oh, this one's going to be easy to check is verse 1-5. So, you remember it's introducing Elkanah and his two wives. And so, if we start in verse 4, it says, On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Verse 5, But to Hannah, he gave, this is what the ESV says, a double portion, because he loved her, though Yahweh had closed her womb. Now, this whole issue is with double portion. What is going on here? Now, most of the Spanish versions that I was seeing talk about a special portion. He gave her a special portion or a chosen portion. So, what is it? Well, in the UBS commentary here, it just says that this phrase is not clear in Hebrew. The Hebrew is literally one portion, two-faced. There are several possible interpretations of the Hebrew. One, a double portion. Two, a single portion. And three, a large portion. To further complicate the matter, get this, the Septuagint translation seems to require a slight change in both the spelling and pronunciation of the Hebrew text to read one portion, comma, although. So, in other words, in the Septuagint, it would say, but to Hannah, he gave one portion although he loved her. So, that's a very different reading. The RSV translation is based on the Septuagint. The New Jerusalem Bible likewise follows the Septuagint in reading, to Hannah, however, he would give only one portion. For although he loved Hannah more, Yahweh had made her barren. Note that according to the Septuagint, he gave Hannah one portion, although or despite the fact that he loved her more. That is, Elkanah gave Hannah one portion only. Not because he loved her less, but rather because she had no children and therefore needed only one portion for herself. According to the Hebrew, however, he gave her a special or double portion because he loved her more. Critique textuel de l'Ancien Testament, CTAT, otherwise abbreviated, pardon my French, gives a B rating to the MT the Masoretic text, and recommends that it be followed. Some interpreters understand the Hebrew to mean a double portion. This is the basis for translations such as, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. NRSV and NIV do that. Citat, however, states that the Hebrew expression most likely does not mean double. It therefore recommends that the Hebrew refers to a part which was particularly large and honorable for the person receiving it. This understanding is the basis for translations such as, but to Hannah he gave a portion twice as large because he loved her very much. Translators should follow the Masoretic text here and not the Septuagint. The difference in meaning is small between a double portion and a special portion. 
either of these two translations may be followed. End quote. So, a <laughs> big surprise. You may have never thought such a simple little thing as double portion or special portion would cause such a headache to try to get to the bottom of. But we learn something new every day. Let's wrap it up here. Thank you so much for listening once again. It's great to have you following this podcast. This is a place where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and ultimately become more like the man of Psalm 1. Mm-hmm.